Gospel of John. Chapter 19. chapter 19 beginning in verse 12 and from thenceforth Pilate sought to release him but the Jews cried out saying if thou let this man go thou art not Caesar's friend whosoever maketh himself a king speaketh against Caesar when Pilate therefore heard that saying he brought Jesus forth sat down in the judgment seat in a place that is called the pavement but in the Hebrew Gabbatha and it was the preparation of the Passover and about, and about the sixth hour and he saith unto the Jews behold your king but they cried out away with him away with him crucify him Pilate saith unto them shall I crucify your king the chief priest answered we have no king but Caesar then delivered he him, therefore, unto them to be crucified, and they took Jesus and led him away. And he, bearing his cross, went forth into a place called the place of a skull, which is called in the Hebrew, Golgotha, where they crucified him, and two other with him on either side, and Jesus in the midst. When I survey the wondrous cross, Father... We thank you tonight for being so good to us. Lord, I pray that as we gather around the cross this evening, Lord, may we see it in a way we've never seen it before. Lord Jesus, may it draw us closer to you. Lord, may it answer some questions that we have in our own life. Lord, may it bring conviction. Lord Jesus, may it, may it bring, uh, Lord, healing tonight. Lord Jesus, we thank you tonight for the cross. We thank you for your shed blood that we might have forgiveness, remission, covering, taking away of our sin. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen. By reading through uh, the gospel accounts of Christ's life, uh, by reading through the gospel accounts of his suffering, of his death, and his resurrection, it is nearly impossible to understand them and then not be moved by the wonderful love and the wonderful grace of Jesus Christ. Every time you read the Gospels and you read an account of Jesus Christ, death, burial, and resurrection, as you search it in depth and you study it and you detail it and you, you write notes for yourselves, something of the grace of God and something of the love of the Lord Jesus Christ should grab a hold of your Hard. The concluding chapters of all four Gospels give a glimpse of the many sufferings Jesus endured because of His love for sinners. Our Lord was put through a mock trial before people who demanded that He be crucified. He uh, allowed them, and make sure you get that tonight, He allowed them to mock Him and spit upon Him. Peter, one of His own disciples, denied Him in the midst of His suffering. Pilate, the Roman governor Pilate, had him scourged. Jesus was stripped. He was brutally whipped and nailed to a cross for our sins. Those he loved mocked him or, or mocked his royalty and placed a crown of thorns on his head. They beat that crown of thorns on his head. They compressed it down with a reed, a big stick. They plucked the hair from his beard. They mockingly bowed before him while spitting on him and smiting him. Now, the question that comes to my mind is this. Not so much for Jesus, but for God the Father. Why would the Almighty God of the universe allow lowly sinners to do this to his son? Jesus did not have to do it. Jesus did not have to agree to come to this earth and bear the shame and the suffering of all men. He could have stopped those who degraded him. What made him go to Calvary? It's just one word. It's the word love. 
It's the word love. Love for you and, and love for me. John 15, 13, Jesus said, Greater love has no man than this, that a man lay down his life for his friend. Hey, God loves us. Amen? I mean, what a wonderful, divine truth. What an amazing thought. We recognize His love every time we consider His suffering on the old rugged cross. Man, may the cross of Jesus Christ always be much more than a symbol. May it always be much more than just a decoration. Listen, as we consider the cross, may we always remember the suffering that Jesus endured for every single one of us. You know what? When I look at the cross, I see three things. Number one, I notice that it was a cross of burdens. It was a cross of burdens. Consider the burdens that Christ endured on the cross. John chapter 19, look at verse 17. The Bible says, And he bearing his cross went forth into a place called the place of a skull, which is called in the Hebrew Golgotha. Now, as the Lord Jesus Christ hung on the cross, He endured every type of pain that you and I could imagine. At least three types that I want to bring out to you tonight. Number one, His burdens were physical. As we look at a cross of burdens, we notice His burdens certainly were physical. Uh, the Bible tells us that on that day, Jesus Christ was scourged. And, and uh, this was a Roman way to bring severe physical punishment. That scourge had a handle with several leather cords attached. These strips of leather were weighted with jagged pieces of bone and, and metal, even glass. That's what was used to whip the Lord Jesus Christ. Under the Jewish law, you had to stop at 39 lashes. But under Roman law, the number was unlimited. And so Jesus, was, uh, Jesus experienced this glass and metal pierced through his back. Those, those leather straps would rip back until the metal and glass came tearing across his back. After that abuse, they placed our Savior on a wooden crossbeam. As the Lord Jesus Christ carried the cross to Calvary, his body came to a point of complete physical exhaustion. He fell. The uh, writer uh, <clears throat> Mark tells us in his gospel in chapter 15, he falls beneath the weight of the cross. He cannot carry it the rest of the way. And the Bible says Simon the Cyrene comes out and he begins to help Jesus carry the cross. Out of his love for us, Jesus had taken on a limited human body. His human strength was weak and his physical burden was heavy. Isaiah describes it like this, prophesies it like this in Isaiah chapter 53 and verse 4. Surely he hath borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we did esteem him stricken, smitten of God and afflicted. Uh, verse 5, but he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him and by his stripes we are healed. It was a cross of burdens. His burdens were physical, but his burdens were also emotional. Can you imagine how Jesus must have felt as he was there in the garden and Judas leading a band of soldiers and religious leaders, Judas comes and gives him the kiss of betrayal. Maybe you're in here tonight and you know what it means to be betrayed by a friend. Someone very close to you, it's heartbreaking. It feels like a knife going into your back. Jesus understood the pain of being rejected by those he loved. Judas betrayed him. Peter denied him. Other of those friends left him and some even mocked him. As Jesus anticipated the cross, knowing all the pain he was about to face, he carried, he carried such a great emotional burden that the Bible says he sweat great drops of blood. Just before the cross, he spent time alone with his father, the only one truly there for him during that time. The Bible says in Luke 22 that Jesus prayed saying, Father, if thou be willing, remove this cup from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but thine be done. And there appeared an angel unto him from heaven, strengthening him. And being in agony, he prayed more earnestly. And his sweat was, as it were, great drops of blood falling down to the ground. Jesus Christ's emotional and physical burdens were greater than what any of us could ever comprehend. But those were not the heaviest of his burdens. You see, his, he also had burdens that were spiritual. 
As he hung on the cross that day, he bore the weight of the sin or the sins of all humanity. 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse 24. You ought to scribble that verse down. Go home and, and contemplate it. Read it. Meditate on it. 1 Peter 2 24. The Bible says, Who his own self bear our sins. In his own body, on the tree, that we, being dead to sins, should live under righteousness. By whose stripes ye were healed. You see, the perfect sinless Son of God had now become sin. Every lie, every wicked thought, every immoral act, ever, every devious intent, indecent gesture, every sin of mankind was in his body as he hung on that cross. Surely part of the burden Jesus sensed in the Garden of Gethsemane caused him to sweat great drops of blood was the anticip anticipation of the spiritual weight as the sins of the world would be upon him. There on the cross, God the Father would turn his eyes away from God the Son. Because Jesus was bearing the sins of the entire world, that was the burden of the cross. That's what he carried for you and me. The cross shows, listen, the cross shows the holy severity of God towards sin and it shows us the foolishness of treating sin lightly and flippantly. Or it should. Proverbs 14, 9, the Bible says, Fools make a mocking sin, but among the righteous there is faith. The cross silences any argument that God does not love us. Uh, many may question why this was necessary for the redemption of mankind. Why did Jesus Christ have to go through all of that suffering to save us? Well, the answer is very simple. The shedding of blood has always been necessary for the remission of sin. When I survey the wondrous cross, I notice that it was a cross of burdens. But second of all, it was a cross of blood the cross of blood. Crucifixion was the most painful way the Romans knew to kill somebody. It was the most painful and it was the most enduring way to kill somebody. The significance of this type of death was the amount of blood the body lost. The amount of blood that was shed. Jesus had to die a bloody death because Blood is essential according to the Word of God for sin to be forgiven. Hebrews 9, 22. And almost all things are by the law purged with blood. And without the shedding of blood is no remission. Jesus Christ did indeed shed His blood and His wounds were so severe that His visage, His, his face, His recognition was absolutely beyond which anybody could recognize. It was a terrible bloody death, but it was necessary. I want you to consider three things about the blood or two things about the blood. Number one, it was supernatural blood. Huh? Say amen. amen. It was supernatural blood. Only Jesus' blood was able to save mankind from their sin because Jesus was God in human flesh. Everything about the life of Christ was miraculous and powerful. Starting even there in the little town of Bethlehem. Jesus born of a virgin and conceived by the Holy Ghost. Jesus was fully God and fully man. The Bible says in Luke 1 verse 35, The angel answered and said unto her, The Holy Ghost shall come upon thee, and the power of the high shall overshadow thee. Therefore also that holy thing which shall be born of thee shall be called what? The Son of of God. You see, the world rejects the truth that Jesus Christ was anything more than a good man. Because if the world accepts the fact that He is God, then they would have to accept the truth that He's the only way to heaven. And the world doesn't want to do that, my friend. Acts 20, 28. Take heed therefore unto yourselves and to all the flock over the which you have, the Holy Ghost hath made you overseers to feed the church of God. Listen to this. Which he hath purchased with his own blood. What blood was in the veins of Jesus? It was the blood of God flowing through the veins of Jesus. It was the blood of God that came streaming down the cross that day for you and for me. You see, churches are not made of walls and nails. The church is comprised of people who have been born again. 
The price that was paid for us to be born again was the precious blood of Christ, the perfectly sinless blood of Christ. No man was conceived the way Jesus was and no one else's blood could ever atone for my sin. We are redeemed only through the precious supernatural blood of Jesus. The blood of Christ was supernatural blood. But listen to this. The blood of Jesus was supplying blood. It was supplying. The blood of Christ provides, it supplies miraculous opportunities far beyond the miracle of salvation. When Jesus shed His blood, He gave us the opportunity to have direct access to God. Did you know that when I pray, I can go directly to God through His Son, Jesus Christ. That's the new covenant. You see, in the Old Testament, men came through the high priest. And the high priest would sprinkle the correct blood on the altar at the Day of Atonement. It was through this means that the Jews made their prayers for atonement. But listen to me now, because of Christ's shed blood, we don't have to go through a high priest. We have direct access to the Heavenly Father. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 19, Having therefore, brethren, boldness to enter into the holiest by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way which He hath consecrated for us through the veil, that is to say, His flesh. I think you would agree with me tonight that right down to the very bone, you and I, spiritually speaking, are worthless. We're unworthy. Yet we're now invited into the presence of God because of the merit Jesus Christ applied, supplied to our accounts. Listen to the writer of Hebrews in chapter 4. Precious words. Verses 15 and 16. For we have not an high priest which cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmity. You know what that means? That means there's nothing we'll ever feel that he hadn't felt first. But was in all points tempted like as we are yet without sin. Let us therefore come boldly unto the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Look at me. All of us need grace to help in time of need. We all need grace. From time to time, we all have burdens that are heavy on our hearts. In those times we need to come to Jesus Christ for grace in our needy condition. We don't have to set up an appointment with a priest to tell him about our burdens, just hoping that our prayers will get up to God. We have direct access to God the Father because of Jesus Christ shed blood. Although Christ's blood provided mankind direct access to the throne of God, you know there are a lot of folks in the Roman Catholic Church that believe they have to go before a priest to confess their sins. But the Bible's very clear. The Bible teaches that going to a priest to confess sin is unnecessary. Because of Jesus Christ's shed blood, we don't need the intervention. We don't need the assistance of any man. No matter where you are, you can approach the throne of God for the atonement of sin, and you can approach the thr throne of God for grace in time of need. May we never get over to the fact that we do not have to make an appointment to meet with the King of Kings. Amen? I'm telling you, when I look in the phone book, his phone number is not unlisted. I don't have to worry about getting call waiting. I don't have to worry about knocking on his office door and him not answering. I, I don't have to worry about him being out of the office for a week of vacation. I'm telling you, at any moment, I can drive down Wolf Creek Road tonight when I leave this place and I can talk to God, I can sing to God, I can harmonize with God all I want to and he hears every bit of it. Amen, glory to God. May we never get over that fact. Since He's available to us, we should be approaching Him, approaching His throne on a daily basis to find sweet fellowship with Him. And then the last thing that I see, when I look at the cross, when I survey the wondrous cross, I see a cross of blessings. A cross of blessings. Burdens, blood, blessings. Jesus Christ hung on that cross. Suffering for the sins of all men, he uttered three words.
just before he passed from this world back to eternity. Those three words were this, it is finished. Look at verse 30 of John 19. Verse 30. When Jesus therefore had received the vinegar, he said, it is finished. He bowed his head and gave up the ghost. The specific word there that is used in the Greek language is the word to telestai. It literally means, get this, it means paid in full. So basically Jesus Christ was looking up to heaven and saying, paid in full. <laughs> Everything's taken care of. Uh, the word in its perfect tense implies that this was an act of payment that occurred once and for all with continuing results. No payment has to be made. There no longer has to be an old rugged cross. Jesus doesn't have to die again for the sin of the world. No, my friend, one time took care of it all. Jesus had fulfilled His role and God the Father tore the veil between God and man. Mankind could now have the blessings of the cross. What are they, preacher? Well, first of all, we have redemption through His blood. <laughs> we have redemption through His blood. We were once lost and separated from God, but because of the shedding of Christ's blood, we are redeemed. He hath bought us back. Hebrews 9, 22, the Bible says, And almost all things are by the law purged with blood. We read it a moment ago. And without shedding of blood is no remission. If there is no shedding of blood, there is no redemption for sin. If there is no shedding of blood, I am still bound by the devil. I'm still shackled by the devil. I'm still his slave. But if Jesus Christ shed his blood, and I call out, him to say, call out to him to save me, and the blood is applied to my heart and life, man, I am bought off Satan's slave market. I'm bought off the slave market of sin. And I'm reconciled to Almighty God, my Heavenly Father. Amen, preacher. All of us have sinned, and we all needed someone to redeem us. We all have a sin nature. Romans 5, 12. Wherefore is by one man centered into the world. That one man was Adam. By one man sin entered into the world. And death by sin. Adam sinned. Sin into the world. Death came because of sin. And so death passed upon all men. When I'm born, I'm born to die. For that all have seen. There's a little boy and a little sister, and they they were both riding a rocking horse together. And at first, they enjoyed riding together, but then they, you know how little brother and little sister are, they, they felt kind of squished. And so convinced he had the perfect solution, the little boy told his sister, he said, if one of us would just get off, there would be plenty of room for me. We can probably identify with that young boy's selfish response in some way. We all have pride in us because we're all born in sin. All of us need Christ's shed blood to cover our sins. We read it in 1 Peter 1, 18 and 19. We are redeemed with the precious blood of Christ as a lamb without blemish and without spot. You remember in the Old Testament, when Pharaoh kept the Israelites in bondage, after God had repeatedly commanded him to free them, it wasn't until God sent ten plagues that Pharaoh finally relented. And let them go. You know what the last plague was? Do you remember that last plague? I love to watch this in the old Charlton Heston Ten Commandments. That last plague, the Lord allowed the death angel to go through the land of Egypt and kill the firstborn child of every family. But the angel of death did not go into every house. He would look in, at the doorpost and he was looking for the shed blood that God had told the Israelites to apply to their doorpost if they wanted the death angel to pass by. If that sign was there, there would be no death to come to that house. In Exodus 12, verse 13, the Bible says, And the blood shall be to you for a token upon the houses which you are. And when I see the blood, I'll pass over you. 
And the plague shall not be upon you to destroy you when I smite the land of Egypt. Listen, has the blood been applied to you? When he sees the blood, he'll pass by. Hmm. Just as the Israelites were freed from this faith through the shed blood, we are freed from sin through the blood of Jesus. Without his blood, we don't have redemption of sin. Jesus Christ was sacrificed once. And now he's seated at the right hand of God the Father. And his blood allows all who will come to him to be cleansed. That is redemption. But listen, the second blessing is this. We have justification through his blood. We've got ju- Once Christ redeems us, we're declared justified. It means just as if I had never sinned. God bought us back and, and put us uh, in a state of being justified, in a state of being forgiven. Listen to Romans 3, verses 23 through 25. Listen to what he says. Paul says, For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. We all have memorized that voice, we, uh, that verse. We use it witnessing. But have you read 24 and 25? He goes on to say, Being justified freely by His grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God hath set forth to be a propitiation through faith in His blood, to declare His righteousness for the remission of sins that are passed through the forbearance of God. Our justification is not about our human works. Our justification is all about the grace of God. Salvation through the blood. Redemption is not found in works or in religion. It's found only in the finished work of Jesus Christ on the cross. The forgiveness of Christ allowed God's righteous demands to be met. That's what that $25 word was in verse 24 and 25 that Paul used. The word propitiation. It just means the, the, that the just demands of God's law have been met. His righteous demands. A righteous God could not allow a sinful person into heaven. Could not do it. But because Jesus paid the price for our sin, God is just and He is right when He allows a forgiven sinner to enter heaven. It's all based on the merit of the blood of Christ. Don, you correct me if I'm wrong. But I believe I'm right here. Forest fires can bring a great amount of devastation. When these fires come sweeping through the trees, experts say that there is only one place the fire cannot reach. That is the place where the fire has already burned itself out. Calvary is the place where the fire of God's judgment has already burned itself out completely against sin. That's why Calvary is the only safe place to come for your sin problem. The judgment of God has already fallen there. And when you come to the cross of Calvary, you're justified. You're safe in the arms of Jesus. Amen? Say hallelujah right there. (laughs) Then we have reconciliation through His blood and I'm done. We have reconciliation. Well, maybe one more little point. The Bible says in our sin we were far from God. But when Jesus atoned for our sin, He reconciled man to God. It's what Paul said in Colossians 1, verse 20. He said, And having made peace through the blood of His cross by Him, to reconcile all things unto Himself, I say, whether they be things in earth or things in heaven. I want you to listen to what Tim LaHaye said. Tim LaHaye said this. He said, The idea that all religions point to the same God is blasphemy. I agree with that. I was asked the other day, Preacher, Do the Muslims and Christians, do they worship the same God just calling different names? Absolutely not. The idea that all religions point to the same God is blasphemy. Tim LaHaye goes on to say, he says, so is the idea that there are many ways to God. Buddha, Mary, Gaia, Muhammad, and Christ are not equal. They do not at all carry equal weight with the triune God of the Bible. Just one was God's only begotten Son and He alone gives us access to God. Now whatever you may say or whatever you may think about Tim LaHaye, I'm going to tell you what, he's right on right there. There's only one way for man to be reconciled with God and that's through the blood of Jesus. Ephesians 1 verse 7 in whom we have redemption through His blood, the forgiveness of sins according to the riches of His grace. Redemption, justification, reconciliation, 
are three blessings that the cross brings us, but there's a fourth and I'm done. Salvation. There's salvation in the blood. Because of the shed blood of Jesus Christ, we can be saved from the penalty of sin. We don't have to hope that one day when we stand before God, we don't have to hope that in some way our good works outweigh our bad works and then we get in. We don't have to spend our lives hoping to earn enough merit to gain salvation because of what Jesus has already done. I can be saved. Hebrews 12, 3, For consider him that endured such contradiction of sinners against himself, lest you be weird and faint in your minds. Listen, when you ache on the inside, look to the cross. When your suffering seems too much to bear, look to the cross. I mean, when your heart is broken, when your back has been stabbed, when you're going through the most difficult time of your life, look to the cross. Look to Jesus. He bore the cross for you and He offers to help you bear the burdens that you are carrying tonight. He invites you to bring your cares to Him. Matthew chapter 11 verse 28 Come unto me all ye that labor and heavy laden and what? I'll give you rest. Matthew eleven twenty nine. 29 Take my yoke upon you and learn of me for I am meek and lowly in heart and ye shall find rest unto your souls for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Listen, no matter what you may be going through right now no matter what you're going through right now Jesus understands. Nobody can conquer you. Nobody can love you. Nobody can guide you the way God can. You ever been trying to comfort somebody in their hurt and in their pain? And you're thinking something like this in your mind or you say this. There's not really much I can do. I don't know what to say. I can't take away the pain. Listen, nobody can comfort you like God. He understands your sufferings. And He can give you His power to overcome. As you consider the sufferings that Christ endured, you'll find peace in knowing that the same God who is loving enough to save you same God who is loving enough to save you is loving enough to help you with any cross you may have to bear. Heads are bowed out.